Now, if you'll take your Bibles, Luke chapter 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Stand with me as we read God's Word together. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. And today as we gather around the Lord's table, it's really fitting the text that we have for today. Because the text talks about salvation being like a banquet, being like a great meal that God invites people to come to. Notice what the Word of God says beginning in verse 15 of the text. When one of those who reclined at table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's house and and they're watching him to see what he will do. And in the midst of everything, someone, we don't know who, calls out and just says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. The Jewish people often considered the kingdom of God to be like a great feast that people came to. Notice what Jesus said, verse 16. But Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Lord God, I thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for the time to worship you and to hear your voice speak to us. Lord, I ask that you would move me out of the way and Lord, speak through your word that we might hear you and that we might respond to you. We'll give you glory and honor for all that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Set free to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ does not ask for admirers. There are a lot of people who admire Jesus. In fact, it's amazing. People who don't call themselves Christians at all, people of other religions will often express their admiration for Jesus. They'll say that they think he's a great teacher or a great prophet. Some will even say they believe he's the son of God, someone to be admired. But Jesus Christ never asked to be admired. Instead, he commanded people to follow him. That's what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to respond to the call of Jesus to follow Jesus. Him. Following Jesus means obeying Him. It means surrendering yourself to Him. It means giving your whole life to Him in faith and obedience and trust. He calls you to follow Him. And as we look at this text of Scripture, I want you to think with me about five aspects of the invitation to follow Jesus Christ. Five aspects of Jesus' invitation for us to follow him. First of all, we see the invitation to follow Jesus extended. The invitation to follow Jesus extended. If you'll look in your text, in verse 17 of the text, Jesus is talking about salvation and comparing it to a great feast. And he says a man had a great banquet and he invited many. Ahead of time, he had invited people to come. In those days, if you were giving a, a party, if you were having a feast or a banquet, you would tell people way ahead of time, hey, I'm going to have this party on such and such a date or on these, uh, these several dates. You just sort of tell them when it was coming. But then when it was time for the actual meal to be served, when it was time for the party to start, you would send out somebody and say, okay, everything's ready. It's time for you to come. And so the Word of God says salvation is like a great banquet. And This man who gave the great banquet represents God. And the many people he invited are God's people, Israel. And if you read in the Old Testament, you see over and over and over again, God kept telling his people, Israel, that he was preparing to send them salvation through the Messiah. Someone has counted over 3,000 promises of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Very specific promises promises and then an invitation to come and to know the Messiah. When Jesus Christ arrived on the scene, he came preaching a message saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. The time has been fulfilled. So repent and believe the gospel. And so the Bible says that in the same way, uh, this servant goes out and says to people, come 
for everything is now ready. Look at those words in verse 17. Come. Jesus Christ calls people to come to himself. Why? Because everything is now ready. May I remind you, everything that needs to be done for you to be saved was done and accomplished when Jesus died on the cross. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. Nothing that we bring to the table with us. We just simply come and everything has been prepared. Jesus has fully prepared salvation. I heard a story about a worship service and the preacher gave an evangelistic invitation and a young man came and walked the aisle and took the pastor's hand. He said, listen, I, I trusted Jesus Christ last week as my Savior. And, and the pastor said, well, wonderful. I'll introduce you to the congregation. And so he introduced the young man. He said, this young man, he'd never met the young man before. He said, this young man has just trusted Jesus as his Savior. And then he asked him, he put the guy on the spot. He said, just tell us what happened. And the young man said, well, uh, I did my part. And God did his part. And that sort of worried the pastor. He said, well, tell me what you mean by that. The young man said, I did all the sinning. Jesus did all the saving. That's how it works. The only thing you bring to Jesus is your sin. And he does all the saving. Come, for everything is now ready. And so the invitation to follow Jesus has been extended. And may I tell you, it's been extended to you. He has extended to every person in here the opportunity and the invitation to come because salvation has been fully prepared. And so we see the invitation to follow Jesus extended. But then secondly, as we look at this text, we see the invitation to follow Jesus excused. The invitation excused. Look in verse 18 of the text. The Bible says, but they all alike began to make excuses. Again, this represents the rejection of the gospel and the rejection of Jesus by his own people, the people of Israel. The word of God says in the gospel of John chapter one, Jesus came to his own world, but his own people, the Jewish people did not receive him. And we see that in this parable as the Bible says, they all alike began to make excuses. And then Jesus just gives three representative excuses. I want you to look at each one. One asked to be excused because of his wealth. The Bible says the first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. This was a land speculator, a wealthy man, and he had bought some land. And so he said, I, I bought this land and I really don't have time to come. Uh, it's not important enough for me to come to this feast. I've got to go and, and check on my investment. His wealth kept him from coming. And then the next man, his work kept him from coming. He has to be excused because of his work. And another said, verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. His work kept him from coming. This was a working man. He had oxen. He had just bought them. He wanted to test them out to make sure that they could do what they needed to do to pull the plow. And so his work caused him to need to be excused. So the first man has to be excused because of his wealth. The second man has to be excused because of, because of his work. The third man, now y'all just stay with me. I'm not saying this. This is Jesus saying this. The third man has to be excused because of what? His wife. His one because of his wealth, one because of his work, and third because of his wife. Look in verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I don't know if he just got married. I don't know whether he'd been married for some time, but he has to be excused because of his wife. Now, I want you to look at each one of those, and I want you to think about reasons that people give not to come to Jesus. Some are like that first man. They, they say, I've just got so much stuff going on, and I don't want to give up one aspect of my life. I don't want to give up one aspect of my pleasure. I don't want to give one aspect up of, of who I am and, and what I do and how I live to follow Jesus. Some people let wealth and the things of this world keep them from following Jesus. Some are like the second man who said, I, I'm not going to let my work, I'm going to let my work keep me from following Jesus. We say, well, I'm just so busy. I've got so many things going on. I don't have time to follow Jesus. And then some are like the third man. He let a relationship with another person keep him from saying yes to the invitation. Sometimes we say that. Well, if, if I say yes to Jesus, it'll put a strain in my relationship with my parents or with my kids or with my husband or with my wife or with a friend. And so therefore, we let that be 
our excuse. There are all kinds of excuses that people give to keep from following Jesus. But the Word of God says in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, Oh man, you are without excuse. No matter what your excuse may be, no matter what excuse you may offer to keep from following Jesus, ultimately your excuse winds up being very empty. I heard about a man who asked his neighbor, he said, can I borrow your lawnmower? I just, my lawnmower's not working. I, I need to mow my yard. Can I borrow your lawnmower? And the guy said, well, I, I can't let you borrow my lawnmower because I'm using my lawnmower to clean my bathtub. And the guy said, well, you can't use a lawnmower to clean a bathtub. And the neighbor said, well, that's true, but I don't want to let you use my lawnmower. And so one excuse is just as good as another. There are all kinds of excuses that people give for not following Jesus, but really one excuse is just as good as another and none of them are good. Some people say, well, I don't want to give my life to Jesus because I think I'm such a good person that I don't need to be saved. Some people offer up that excuse, I'm a good person, I live a good life, I don't need to be saved or follow Jesus. The Bible says you're without excuse. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes you. Other people would say, well, I'm just, I'm just so bad. You don't understand. I can't ask Jesus to save me. My life has been so bad. I've got so much stuff in my life I'm ashamed of. I'm too bad to follow Jesus. Oh, no, you're without excuse, too, because the Bible says there's nobody that Jesus Christ cannot and will not save. The Word of God says, though your sin be, may be as scarlet, he can make it as white as snow. Being a bad person, having a bad background doesn't excuse you from following Jesus. Some people say, well, I would follow Jesus, but, but I still have questions. They're just unanswered questions. And, and until I get all my questions answered, I can't follow Jesus. Here's what I've learned. I don't have to understand every ingredient in a dish a chef prepares in order to sit at the table and enjoy it. And you don't have to understand and have every question answered to taste and see that the Lord is good. It may be that your questions will only be answered when you stop hanging on to your questions and start turning to Jesus and following him. But some use that as an excuse. You are without excuse. Others would say, well, well, I would give my life to Jesus, but I want to wait. And we've said this before, but may I say it again? God never calls you to be saved later. He never talks about following Jesus tomorrow. The Word of God says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And so we see the invitation to follow Jesus excused. I want to remind you of something. No excuse you're holding on to is worth going to hell for. No reason you're holding on to, no excuse, whatever it is, it's not worth missing heaven and going to hell. Jesus Christ issues that invitation. Don't make an excuse. Number three, we see the invitation to follow Jesus enlarged. The invitation to follow Jesus enlarged. Look in verse 21 of the text. The Bible says, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. He came and said, hey, I've gone to everybody that you invited. Everybody has excuses. The Bible says, then the master of the house became angry. It's a reminder to us that when we reject God's offer to save us, we will receive God's judgment and God's anger for our own sin. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Get everybody you can, the people who never would come to a banquet like that. Go wherever you can go on the, on the major roads and the little lanes. Just go and get them and bring them in. Verse 22, and the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. Don't take no for an answer that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. He enlarged the invitation. And as we're thinking about Israel, when Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, God turned and enlarged the invitation to be saved 
to Gentiles, to those who are outside of the nation of Israel. I praise God for that because I'm a Gentile and you're a Gentile in all likelihood as well. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And the word of God says that God has extended and God has enlarged his invitation so that anyone can come. Why? Because God wants as many people as possible to come to his table. Something happened back in 2020. A young couple named Emily Bug and Billy Lewis were engaged to be married in the area of Chicago. And they had their wedding planned. They had already uh, hired the, the venue that they were going to have the wedding in. They had already hired the caterer and paid a down payment, $5,000 as a deposit to the caterer. They had a big wedding planned in November of 2020. But you know what happened in 2020. COVID came and shut everything down. And so when it came time for their wedding, they couldn't have the ceremony. They couldn't have the party. They couldn't have anything. But they still had that money tied up with the caterer. And so they had a small wedding in a courthouse with just them and the photographer and maybe a few of their family members there. But then they wanted to do something with that money that they had given the caterer. So here's what they did. They asked the caterer to provide 200 meals to serve to people with, with uh, mental illnesses and, and drug addiction in the, in the inner city of Chicago. And this newlywed husband and wife went and served all of those meals themselves. They didn't want one morsel of food to go to waste. In very much the same way, God loves us so much and he desires so much for everyone to be able to come to the table that he has enlarged his invitation. It includes you. Here's what this means. There's nothing in your life that will keep you from coming to God's table of salvation if you desire to come. Nothing about your background. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your past is, who your family is, what you've done. It doesn't matter anything about that. If you're willing to come, God has extended and enlarged that invitation to include you. We see the invitation to follow Jesus enlarged. And then fourthly, as we continue through this text, we see the invitation to follow Jesus evaluated. We see the invitation to follow Jesus evaluated. Now look in verse 25 of the text. The Bible says, now great crowds accompanied Jesus. By this time, he's gotten up from the table there in the Pharisee's house, and he's making his way closer and closer to Jerusalem. And as he goes along the way, more and more people are following him. And it's amazing what Jesus does. The Bible says in verse 25, he turns to those who are following him, these large crowds, and he begins to tell them, hey, if you really want to follow me, if you really mean business, then you need to evaluate what you are doing. If you notice in verse 26, in verse, uh, verse 26 of the text, he talks about evaluating who you must reject to follow him. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He said, listen, if, if your family is calling you to stay when you should be following me and you're not willing to reject them and follow me, he said, you're not ready to be my disciple. If you put your own life and your own, own, own livelihood and your own safety above following me, he says, you're not ready to be my disciple. He talks about who we must reject. Then he talks about what we must endure. Look at what he says in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. In those days, everyone understood what it meant to bear a cross. When the Romans executed a criminal, they would have that criminal carry his own cross all the way to the place to be crucified. A cross was an instrument of suffering and death. And so the Bible says we must be willing to endure and to suffer and even to die for Jesus in order to follow him. And then he talks about what we must spend what we must be willing to spend in order to follow Jesus. Look in verse 28. He says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? He said, If you're going to build a tower and you start off building it and you lay the foundation and you start the wall, but then you stop and you don't complete the project, you show that you either didn't really want to build the building to begin with or you didn't have what it took to make it happen and to bring it to completion. The Bible says in the same way, you've got to count the cost before following Jesus. Can I just stop right here? Many people 
who call themselves Christians and yet who falter in following Jesus do so because they never counted the cost. You've got to count the cost. Virtually every accomplishment in life requires counting the cost. If you want to be a great violinist, Yasha Heifetz, a great violinist at age 75, had logged 102,000 hours of practice to be able to play the way he played. If you want to become an artist, remember that Leonardo da Vinci's perfect sketches of the human body came only after incredible effort. On one occasion, he sat and sketched 1,000 hands just so he could learn how to draw the human hand. If you want to be an Olympic champion lifter, then you have to train and lift so much weight that all of those weights together might equal the weight of Devon Tower. It takes counting the cost to be a success at anything. And listen to me, it takes counting the cost to be a success, to be faithful in following Jesus. He talks about what we must be willing to spend, the price we must be willing to pay. And then he talks about whether we are willing to surrender. We have to evaluate whether we will surrender when the battle rages. Look in verses 31 through 33. Jesus says, or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus says following him is like, like going to war. It's like, it's, it's like a king going to war. And he says, if, if a king is not willing to face the enemy and fight, then he just needs to go ahead and surrender at the beginning and not even try to go to war. When you get saved, God puts you on a battleground and you are fighting a battle against Satan because he is warring against God and against God's kingdom and against you. If you're not willing to fight the fight, you're not ready to follow Jesus. Notice the words of Jesus again in verse 33. So any one of you who does renounce, who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It doesn't say you'll be a bad disciple if you don't give up everything to follow him. It doesn't say that you'll be a lackluster disciple. It says you won't be a disciple. You're not following him unless you've counted the cost and said, Lord, I'll follow you no matter what. He talks about the call, the invitation to follow Jesus evaluated. Number five, I want you to see this. The Bible talks about the call and the invitation to follow Jesus expired. There is an expiration date on your opportunity to follow Jesus. Look in verses 34 and 35 of the text. Jesus says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, he's talking about Israel. And he says that Israel was intended to be salt. God intended Israel to be the salt of the earth. For Israel to receive Jesus as their Messiah and then to salt the earth, to influence the whole world so that people all over the world would follow Jesus as Messiah. But when Israel rejected Jesus, they were like salt that lost its saltiness. Now, it's really impossible for salt to lose its saltiness, but I want you to imagine this. Imagine that a whole container full of Morton salt just loses its flavor, loses its saltiness. Well, what can you do with it then? You don't add salt to the salt to make it more salty. That's not what you do. If salt loses its saltiness, what do you do? You throw it away. It's not good for anything because that's its purpose. If you reject Jesus one time too many, if you say no to him one time too many, if you refuse to follow him one time too many as Israel had, then your opportunity to follow him may expire and you'll miss out your entire purpose for life. That's why Jesus says in verse 35, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you hear his voice calling you to follow him today, Today's the time to say yes to Jesus.
Back in 1997, a researcher began to study a group of kids, children who had begun to to, to play musical instruments, all kinds of instruments, drums and guitars and trumpets and saxophones and pianos, all types of instruments that they were playing. And, and his purpose was to see how many of them would continue to play the instrument and how many of them would just give up. Now, if I were to ask you in this room, how many of you here have ever taken musical lessons for any type of instrument, whether it was high school band or piano or guitar. If you've ever taken lessons or tried to learn how to play any musical instrument, just raise your hands right now. Okay, leave your hand up if you would like to play a solo right now on that instrument. (laughs) Most kids who start an instrument stop playing that instrument. And so he was trying to figure out, well, what is it that causes them to, to quit? And here's what he found out didn't cause them to quit. It wasn't whether they had an ear for music, that didn't make a difference, or whether they had a natural sense of rhythm, or whether they had, you know, manual dexterity. None of those things really made a difference. He said the one thing that made a difference was how they answered one question before they even picked up an instrument for the first time. And the question was this, how long do you plan to play? How long do you think you'll keep playing? He said kids who said they were going to play just for a while quit really quickly. Kids who said they're just going to play while they're in school or in this class may have hung on for a couple of years. They quit as well. But the kids who really soared on their instruments were kids who, before they picked up that instrument, said, I want to play this instrument the rest of my life. I want to be a musician. Now, that's true in music. It'd be true in sports. It'd be true in anything. But can I tell you something? It's especially true in your spiritual life. If you just say, well, you know, following Jesus was something I did when I was a little kid. Or following Jesus was just something that I was interested in when I was younger. Then you'll you'll falter. But if you come to Jesus on terms of full surrender and say, Lord, I want to follow you all the days of my life and forever, then you'll soar. You'll soar spiritually. Because when you come to him with that type of surrendered heart, he will use you in incredible ways. And he'll guide you step by step as you follow him. As we gather around the Lord's table today, I want you to ask yourself this question. Are you following Jesus? Some of you are here and you would say, well, you know, I I followed him in the past, but I'm standing still right now. Some of you might say, well, I used to follow him. I'm really going in the wrong direction or I've gotten way off course. Some of you are here and you would say, you know what, I've, I've really never followed Jesus. Today, God wants you to examine your own heart and to commit in your heart today to say yes to his invitation. 